Please make your way back to the theater. Our programming is about to resume. Please make your way back to the theater. Our programming is about to resume. Our next talk is an in-depth look at two games, Fortnite and Wonders of Pyramid uh, of Giza, with technical director uh, at Epic Games, James Golding, and business development director at Preloaded, Matt Vernon Clinch. You'll learn more about how these games empower content creators and players worldwide by offering engaging and purposeful play experiences. Thank you so much for coming, and great to be here. There we go. Oh, perfect. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about Unreal Editor for Fortnite and the opportunity for playing with purpose. Um, I'll start off, and uh, about halfway through, I'll switch over to Matt to talk about one of the projects that's been built with these tools. So there we go. So my name's James Golding. I'm a technical director at Epic Games. I've been there about 20 years now doing lots of different things. Epic does lots of different things. Uh, we create tools like the Unreal Engine, which is used for lots of different applications, including games, including many of the games that have been discussed at this event. And we also create a game called Fortnite, which is also an ecosystem. And we'll talk more about how that works in this talk. So what's Fortnite Creative? It's a part of Fortnite. It was released in 2018 and allows any player to create and share an island which is their own level, their own world inside Fortnite with any other players. So Fortnite has about 500 million total players registered and about 70 million active uh, players each month. But about 40% of the time in Fortnite is actually played in these creative maps, these maps created by other players. So it's a huge number of people that engage in this sort of stuff. Um, inside Fortnite Creative, there are lots of options you have to change the experience from the core sort of Fortnite experience that people might expect. So you can turn off weapons, you can turn off building, you can hide HUD elements, and you can affect things like player movement. So you can start to build experiences that feel quite different from Fortnite and really start to build your own space. This was an example of a, a mindfulness experience that was made by one of the users. Uh, and so here's some other examples of things that have been done with Creative outside of the sort of core game experience. Uh, the artist Cause had an exhibition called New Fiction that was at the Serpentine Gallery in London. So they recreated the same exhibition inside Fortnite at the same time. And so you could experience both of them, and they tied together. We've been doing some work with resources for teachers. So using the Fortnite Creative tools inside the game itself, uh, we've created a number of lesson plans based around the sustainable development goals. So SDG 8, which is decent work and economic growth, and SDG 13 around climate action. So this is encouraging uh, students to actually use the tools to build uh, storm defenses, to establish sustainable tourism. 
We're working with the Arsh Rock Foundation at the Atlantic Council to continue to develop these resources to cover um, more types of uh, content around uh, climate resilience. We also produced an experience back in uh, 2021 called um, March Through Time. We did this with Time Magazine, and we had an amazing response. We had over 15 million players watch the whole of the 15-minute uh, I Have a Dream speech whilst they explored a recreation of the Washington Mall. And this is a community-led event, but this year, 25th of March, there's Earth Hour, which is something run by the World Wildlife Fund. And a number of creators decided to get together and uh, update their islands to incorporate these themes. They turned out the lights on some of the popular islands, and they incorporated sort of environmental gameplay mechanics like recycling and things like that for extra points. And so it's great to see teams get together and use this as a theme running across multiple islands to spread a message to the players that were already engaging with those experiences. So that's Fortnite Creative, and that's been out for a couple of years. And now we've got this new tool called Unreal Editor for Fortnite. And this really takes these tools to a whole new level. So it was released in March this year, and it's a PC application that's based on our Unreal Editor for Unreal Engine 5. And it allows you to iterate directly on a device, so you can create a level and see it on a PlayStation or on an Xbox or something. And then you can publish to Fortnite. So you use the tool on your PC, you hit publish, and then immediately you and anyone else can play that experience uh, on, on any you know, console, any platform. So it really does change the way that you can reach an audience using the um, Unreal Editor. Uh, and you can collaborate as a team on an experience as well. So this opens up a whole new set of possibilities. You can import your own assets now, new meshes, animations, textures, audio, um, and you can use the, the features that are in Unreal Engine 5, like Nanite for high resolution geometry, like Lumen for dynamic GI. So you're suddenly getting a lot of really powerful features that you can start to use, but you can also change the world to look very different than what Fortnite traditionally is thought to look like, and do something that really you know, brings in your own creativity. You also have access to a lot of really powerful tools that Unreal Engine provides. So being able to work on the level, using sequencer to create cinematics, creating complicated materials and particle effects, using control rig to animate characters, and modeling mode and terrain mode as well. So lots of power, and if you're familiar with Unreal Engine at all, you can take that expertise and use it straight in, in your EFN. There's also a scripting language called Verse, which allows you to build more complex behaviors than you could have done previously in Fortnite Creative. So you can start to build interesting new kinds of gameplay, and we're gonna be adding a lot more capabilities to this over time. You'll be able to build a lot more interesting things. Uh, and right within the UEFN editor, we've got a store called Fab. Uh, and so this will allow our assets for free or that you can buy. But one really cool thing about this is it's built on top of Sketchfab, which is already used by a load of uh, cultural heritage institutions, museums, galleries, and that kind of thing to host their assets online. And so you suddenly have access to all these amazing um, historical objects that you can then pull straight into your, into your level and, uh, and build with. So as, as you can imagine, there's lots of use cases that we're interested in outside of just core games. Music has been a big part of Fortnite for a long time, and so we're excited to see what a wide community will be able to do now. They can bring in their own animations, their own characters, their own music. Um, we're already seeing some experiences based around sport. Wimbledon this year had an official island uh, where you could run right through the center of center court. Uh, we're really excited about what education can do, and Matt will be showing some really cool content using these UEFN tools in that area in a minute. Um, and even things like you know, uh, architecture or for, for well-being and mental health, we think there's lots of opportunity, and we're already talking to lots of people about how they can engage this wide audience. Um, just this last weekend, we uh, had a collaboration with the European Space Agency, where we showed an example of a demo where, because they already use Unreal Engine for training astronauts, they had a lot of assets already, and they could just bring those assets, drop them into UEFN, and we could build a level where, as a Fortnite player, you ran around uh, a model of a, a potential moon base. This isn't a screenshot from the, um, from the actual project, but it looked, we, we couldn't, didn't have one in time for the, to put in the slides, but uh, it, it, this was the idea. At the exhibition, we actually had a life-size lander on one side, and then the same lander they'd given us the CAD data for inside uh, a Fortnite level right next to it, and so children playing it were very excited to turn around and see, um, see that right next to them. And again, this is a, a non-combat experience, it's just about um, exploration. So why is UEFN interesting? And like I said, it, it may not be the right tool for every job, but we think it's a really interesting opportunity to reach a wide audience with a set of really powerful tools in a really quick way. So one big benefit is it's free, the game's free, the tools are free, you can download them today and start building stuff. Um, it's cross-platform, the, the game runs on you know, consoles and on PC and on uh, Android, so you can, and on streaming platforms as well. So you can play with your friends across all those different platforms. Uh, you can make use of existing things like a friends list, you can use voice chat to engage your friends, and it's a reduced time to play. So rather than having to take a new application, install it, and play it, you just type in a 12-digit number and you can play 
um, whatever island you create and, and share that with your, with your community. You can also take advantage of things that are already in the game. If you've already got outfits, um, if, uh, and you can unlock more things in the Fortnite Battle Pass just by playing these islands. So people already have an incentive to, to come in and play. Um, and of course, you can reach a really high visual quality. Like I mentioned before, there's lots of the Unreal Engine features that are available right in these tools. So you can start to build some really stunning environments. And again, Matt will show you some of the work that, that they've done that's really outstanding using some of these features. Um, and because these are the same tools that a lot of people are using in uh, movie production, in uh, architecture, in automotive, a lot of that, those skills transfer over. And you know, we're really excited about the possibility where you might be creating a TV series using Unreal Engine, or you might be um, showing a building to a client, and now you can just take those same assets, bring them into UEFN, and very quickly create an additional way of sharing those assets with, with a big audience, engaging them, maybe getting feedback, and, and building whole new kinds of things in this ecosystem, which is good for players, and uh, it's good for, uh, for creators as well. And one of the other exciting things is you can actually make money from this. If enough people play your island, there's a, we split the revenue for Fortnite amongst all the people creating content, including ourselves. So you can actually participate in those, in those payouts. And actually, you know, some of our top creators are now earning you know, substantial amounts from, from very engaging islands, if that's sort of the way that you want to, to take things. So that covers you know, the basics of what UEFN is. Uh, we're really excited to, to meet people here and you know, just think about what these tools could be used for. We think there's a huge opportunity and we're really excited to learn about what features we need to be prioritizing, uh, what we want to add, how we can help people get on board with these tools and you know, really assist in, in any way to, uh, to grow this community and to build some really great stuff. There's loads of resources online to help you get started with the tools and uh, you know, um, please let us know if there's more that, that we can do. And, uh, that feedback is always greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. I'm going to pass it over to Matt, who can do the really fun bit of showing you what's actually possible with these tools. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so as James said, I'm Matt from Preloaded in the UK. You get two Brits for the price of one in this talk. Um, and uh, I kind of, uh, I imagine after seeing that, you're thinking much as Preloaded did when we first understood about these tools, and you're thinking about what a huge opportunity this presents to, um, well, let's dig into this specific of the opportunity as we saw it. Uh, bringing educationally valuable content to Fortnite was something we wanted to do as soon as we found out about these tools. Um, feels like an amazing opportunity as well to meet audiences where they already are. Um, as James said, a, a vast number of people play Fortnite uh, 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 on a monthly basis. And within that, there are a huge percentage of those players already in Fortnite. Um, and then, oh, sorry, already in Fortnite Creative. And then on top of that, um, what does no guns in Fortnite look like? That was something that we wanted to pose to ourselves uh, immediately. We think that the kind of educationally valuable content probably doesn't need to have guns in it. What does that look like? Um, thankfully, there was already, as, as, as James has touched on, a wealth of kind of existing uh, uh, information about how players were playing in Fortnite. Um, Fortnite Creative itself is such a diverse range of different styles of maps that the community themselves has kind of rallied around and started to build. Um, this image on, on the left here just shows you a small selection of the category that's known as adventure, where people are based on, you know, the fundamental modality of play there is about exploration. But it's everything, adventure, tycoon games, racing games, it's not all about combat. And that really kind of for us was a validation of the fact that this is a great platform to be able to take educationally valuable content. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit in a second about what we actually created, but we kind of set ourselves our own kind of tenets of, of, of what we wanted the experience that we were going to build to be. Obviously educationally valuable, but given the tools, we saw the opportunity for creating something that was hugely awe-inspiring, and I'll talk into that. Uh, authentic as well, uh, obviously world building, we wanted uh, to, to create something that could really um, be a canvas for great environmental storytelling uh, in that world building, but also Fortnite native. Wanted it to feel common to the existing audience that was there. Um, let me give you a very quick overview of what we built, uh, Wonders, Pyramids of Giza, um, and then we'll talk into each of these categories quickly. So let's talk about awe-inspiring first. I think what was fantastic about uh, 
UEFN, sorry, um, was that it allows you to build and bring in so many of your, your custom assets, uh, leveraging all of the kind of Quixel um, uh, texture libraries and shaders that are already available in, in UEFN. And that allows you to build some pretty compelling worlds. We were able to take the aesthetics of, of, of Fortnite as it's known and completely throw them out of the window and build something that was completely bespoke and completely um, unique. Um, we, were, we, we set ourselves quite the challenge. We picked the, um, the Giza Plateau at a specific point in uh, Egypt's history, uh, the, the, the height of the fourth dynasty uh, of the Old Kingdom. Um, it's a massive site, um, and the Excel map within, uh, within Fortnite was, uh, allowed us to build something. The actual site is about two kilometers square. And within that, there's an explorable area of about 1.2 kilometers square. So a massive map, and that was kind of uh, amazing to do. Um, we, we made uh, sure that it was a one-to-one -one scale between all of the, uh, the kind of the assets uh, so that we had uh, a real ability to kind of create that awe of just how impressive this site was at its height. Um, so once we've built a really compelling world, uh, a really amazing backdrop, we also wanted to make sure it was authentic. Telling kind of compelling, educationally valuable stories, uh, having that, that uh, ability to um, have the discovery, um, it needed to be authentic. And we were delighted to be able to partner with uh, Professor Joanne Fletcher, very preeminent uh, Egyptologist in this space, um, who helped us get everything right about this, from the macro view of how the pyramids aligned to certain positions, how the Sphinx was uh, located on the site, um, but also the, the, the kind of the micro elements, down to the flowers that were used in the ceremonial areas, the, uh, the old world, the old kingdom hieroglyphics and exactly how they would have looked, the stone, what was milled, you know, what was uh, kind of um, uh, 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 pulled out of the site, what was uh, mined on the site, and what was actually brought in and was a distinctly different stone. Um, we wanted to get it right so that when we were then telling stories with this world, it was, uh, it was compelling and it was accurate. And we were also uh, amazed to be able to use so many of the assets from Sketchfab. As James talked about, there's a huge wealth of cultural institutions and, and, and content creators themselves who are recreating and uploading assets there. Um, and we were delighted to be able to pull some statues in that were authentic and accurate. Um, we were also able to create lots of kind of detail, as I said, the flowers that were used in ceremonies, but the specifics of the statues, the, the, the kind of the detail of human life and culture that was there as well, bowls, tools, all the kind of the small elements that we, we tried to get right, we tried to absolutely ensure were, were as authentic as possible. Um, and then I talked about wanting to make it very Fortnite native. Um, we were aware that we were kind of pushing what Fortnite could look like. We were creating something that felt very educationally valuable, but we also wanted it to feel familiar to Fortnite players. And this was, I think, the biggest challenge. What we ended up doing was using a lot of the common game play modalities and tropes that were existent within the community themselves, and we applied them in kind of a pedagogical sense of how they would be used to tell these stories. So our map is laden with kind of uh, discoverable moments, cinematics, uh, kind of point-based objective discoveries, um, and big social moments as well. We're very aware Fortnite is a very social tool. Um, it's a very social platform. How can we create social storytelling, story-doing moments, if you like? Um, we, I think one of the, the, the strongest stories about this um, is that uh, we didn't realize this at the point that we entered this, but the, the Great Sphinx is actually not built out of stone in the same way that pyramids are. It's carved from solid bedrock. That feels like an incredible story to tell and one that none of us were aware of. So the way that we did that was to ensure players collectively went and carved the pyramid themselves. It's a great way of landing that kind of learning and making sure audiences fundamentally understand it. Um, and then traversal. I, I talked about we, we bit off quite a large site, uh, and we knew that Fortnite players are always moving, but we didn't want them to be moving by running around a site that has some fairly large open areas of desert in it as well. Um, so we created these little dust devils that live around the site um, and that you know, both serve two purposes, really. One is to move you around the map quickly, whilst at the same time also elevating your position. It gives you a unique perspective on this. Obviously, you parachute into it in the opening scene, but then after that, you get the ability to come up really high as well. 
Um, but it's also a, a kind of a, a mini challenge in its own right. There are about 25 of these dotted around the level, and they're strategically placed so you can chain them all. And it's been amazing to see players going and trying to hit all of them in a row and move around the site in a really fast way um, that doesn't require them to, to run around. Um, so that's, that's how we approached uh, uh, the kind of opportunity. And, and obviously, uh, kind of, it's been amazing to see how the community have reacted to this. I think from hardcore Fortnite creative players to the influencers that really do influence how people play these games and what, and what islands they find, it's been fantastic. The top left there is Mustard Plays. If anyone's a big Fortnite player, you probably know the stream of Mustard Plays. Big, big studio moment, I think, to see him absolutely loving sliding down uh, one of the great pyramids uh, as, uh, as Peely there, the banana. Um, some, of the, some of the things that, that surprised us was some of the things we didn't expect. Uh, we didn't know anything about photography, a whole unique skill of Fortnite players to go and build uh, and to take incredible photography within Fortnite. And obviously, with this island's visual style, that awe-inspiring nature, it's been something that's been hugely shared on social media, people using this as a canvas for, 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 for for photography. Um, obviously, no one was able to take a camera back, you know, kind of four and a half thousand years ago. In this, you kind of have the opportunity. And it's amazing to see people uh, uh, using the kind of the, the, the language of how things line up and so on that we, we, we carefully curated as part of that. I'm also very pleased to say that there is a formal lesson plan in the works for this as well. So the opportunity to use this in a kind of in a historical lesson or some kind of classroom context is there as well. Um, and then finally, it, on community reaction, it's been great to see that people understand, both from a cultural perspective, how important this is and how authentic, you know, it's particularly the, the authentic nature of it, but also that it has educational value whilst also loving and playing it at the same time. That's been fantastic to see. Um, and then just a, a, a kind of personal note, uh, the glyphic emote, this kind of Egypt-inspired emote, is something that's been in Fortnite Creative for a while. Um, Definitely uh, a highlight to see this performed by people on social media on the top of uh, a pyramid, kind of 150 meters up, looking out over the, uh, over the island. It's amazing to see. Um, it's out now. We launched it about five weeks ago. There's been hundreds of thousands of players already. Um, uh, take a snap of it. Love to get your feedback. Love to know what you think. Thank you very much. So uh, more great content for you. This next talk will actually be really great for anyone seeking advice on creating games with a positive social impact, as well as insights into the effective use of games for educational purposes. Uh, you're going to join Dr. Chris Alexander, a professor of video game design at Toronto Metropolitan University, as he discusses his work mentoring students in game development and draws examples from student-driven projects to highlight the transformational power of games. Hello. Hello, folks. How you doing? Whoa, hold on. Hello, folks. How you doing? All right. Sweet. All right. Uh, my name is Dr. Chris Alexander, I'm a professor of video games. And today, I'm here to talk to you about pixels with purpose, students, samus, and sameness. Let's get into it. The year was 2013. In 2013, my wife and I had our first baby. And at seven months, my wife was exhausted. Now, here's why. She was feeding the baby. She was up with the baby, sleeping alongside the baby, spending a lot of time. In fact, she would only give me the baby for four hours out of every day. That's right. For seven months, my wife spent 20 hours a day with the baby. And she was exhausted. So. Because she was exhausted, I lied to her. Oh, you shouldn't be laughing. That's sad, yo. How are you laughing? It's like, yo, I know. Let me explain. I said to my wife that for six days, I was going to be working every day from 6 AM all the way until, I hear some, ah! 
ah, all the way until 10 p.m. But remember, I said get to work at 6 a.m. So sometimes I was leaving as early as 4.45 and coming back well after 11.30. And that gasp you heard was because, yo, Chris, that's disrespectful. So after 20 months, sorry, seven months of 20-hour days, and then six days of 24-hour days, as you can imagine, my wife was even more exhausted. Now you might be asking yourself, Chris, why would you do this? Why would you do this to the woman that you love? And I'll tell you why. I'm a researcher, and I found out through some research and conversations with my in-laws that a baby can sleep through the night when they're three months old or 11 pounds. So at month three, I asked my wife, can I sleep train the baby? She said, nah. She didn't say nah, I say nah. She said, no, no, no thank you. <laughs> at 11 pounds, I said, hey baby, can I sleep train this baby? And she said, no. So pay close attention to my lie. I started my lie on Saturday, and on the seventh day, which was a Friday, I said to my wife, after 24 hours, six days, I'm sure you're doing the math, can I please sleep train the baby? And my wife, she said, yes. So it was time for me to go to work. I grabbed the cell phone, I grabbed the tablet, and I sleep trained that baby in one night. That's right, folks. You see the audience like, ooh. Some of the parents are like, what? That's right, folks. One night. In 2015, we had a second baby. And at seven months, I asked my wife, hey, baby. Now, you know, I call my wife baby, and I'm not talking to the baby. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, can I sleep train this baby? And not only did my wife say yes, I sent her to an Airbnb for three nights. And then I sleep trained that second baby in one night. That's right, folks. Two babies, two different times at one night. And the process, the specific steps that I took to sleep train two babies separately is a playable level in the video game I'm making called Bearable, <laughs> a game about family, life, and happiness. And that is what I'm talking about today, folks, pixels with purpose. So let's get started. I want to, oh, should I just end there? All right, cool. All right. I want to talk to you about students, Samus, and sameness. So let's get started with students. I happen to work at a university that used to be called Ryerson University. It's now called Toronto Metropolitan University, or TMU, or as I like to call it, TAMU. <laughs> at TAMU, I'm responsible for teaching video game design, which is how we make, create, and shape an experience for at least one person other than ourselves. Esports broadcasting, I'm a Twitch streamer and a YouTuber. Some of y'all may have seen me on Wisecrack, and some of y'all may have seen my TED Talk, more on that later. I help to get students that have zero subscribers and teach them the technical skills and online persona, five, to present themselves and jump from zero subscribers to over 50,000 subscribers in five weeks. The last area that I help teach students is an area called virtual production. How many people, show of hands, have heard of a, well, Epic was just on stage, wasn't that crazy? Have heard of a game called Fortnite? Great. Can you imagine if people said no? How many people have heard of a television show called The Mandalorian? Oh. All right, so how many people know that the same engine, Unreal Engine, that builds Fortnite, is the same engine that builds some of the backgrounds behind your favorite show, The Mandalorian? That's what I teach students to do. More on that when we get there. But today, in this particular conversation, we're focused on video game design. Now, I had the fortune of helping to pilot video games in those three areas at Tamu. And there, see people are going to be walking around, hashtag Tamu, T-I-M-O-O. -O. Yeah, my school's going to get mad at me, but eh, whatever, try it out. Anyway, at Tamu, I have the fortune of spearheading those areas that I described. And there, all of my classes are not mandatory. And they've jumped, you see the shirt now? I've, they've jumped from 30 students to 80 to this year over 270, and then more next year. 
Students are voluntarily taking our classes because of the link we have between theory, practice, and practicality. So in the student section, I want to talk to you about three core games, exciting games, and I have a secret surprise in the audience for you all today, which I'll get to. It's not free prizes. It's not Oprah. Relax. OK. One is a game by Stephanie called Your Journey. This is a game about immigrating from China. And I'll let the audio play for itself when it gets there. But it's important to note that all of these students are using the video games medium to tell their own stories. And that's kind of the point. We're talking about pixels with purpose. Don't forget, I'm going to show you the purpose behind all of these games that the students are making. The second game is a game by Xavier called You See Me. Now, You See Me is a game about superheroes, but it's actually about being a visible, yet invisible, minority. Now, I didn't come up with this stuff. The students come up with this stuff. The last one, and most excitedly, not most excited, the other students are going to kill me. Anyway, <laughs> the next game is a game called Oblivicence. Now, this game is about indigenous wisdom. And most games, you fight to live. But in this game, you fight to die. Now, I will say, I'm known for doing to my students what's called throwing them over the bus. I walk resumes into AAA studios. I say, yo, you got to hire this person. And I do say, yo. And most times, I'm correct. But for the first time in my academic history, I get to throw a student over the bus live in front of you all today. The person behind this fantastic game is hidden somewhere in this room. And after you see it, I want you to give her a round of applause and connect with her after you see the magnificence that she's put together. Told you I was going to get you. All right, let's get started with your journey. Rather than me tell it, sound on, please. We're going to watch what Stephanie put together for her pixels with purpose. Welcome to your journey. Your journey is a third person narrative adventure game that explores various immigrant stories through engaging gameplay and genuine storytelling. The game takes place in the small traditional university town of Ferncombe. Ferncombe is a slowly growing town and a prime location for families, working folk, and people just moving to the country. Play as Samira, the otter, and Linus the fox as they explore buildings, interact with other characters and objects, and make game-altering decisions all while learning about each other and the town they live in. All stories deserve to be told and heard. Join Samira and Linus as they learn about the many important immigrant stories, experiences, and their own identity. Spectacular. It's important to note, round of applause, because she might be watching live online right now. Great. <laughs> it's important to note that the games I'm showing you today are after students have started working in Unreal Engine for just two sessions with me. But they are incredible creative monsters, as I like to call them. Not a derogatory thing, just relax. Let's move on to the second one, which is You See Me. Now, I'll start this one. There's no audio, so don't worry, sound folk. Um, you will see that Xavier has put his blueprint work at the beginning of his video. As I mentioned, I like to throw students over the bus, and I tell them that process takes priority and principle when you're looking for jobs. They want to see that you can show what you know. So what he did was he put his blueprint for the stealth mechanic that he put in his game. Now, this game couches the narrative of being a superhero inside of the narrative of what it's like to be an invisible yet visible minority. No spoilers. Xavier will tell you on his own if he were here. A round of applause if he's watching at home. Let me look at those cameras. Yeah. <laughs> now, this last one, near and dear. The story behind Alessandra is uh, she came up to me one day and said, hey, I don't know if video games are for me. And she'll probably tell you this. I said, they absolutely are. And then one year later, she produced this spectacular game. And not only that. Partway after her first year, she got hired as an intern at a AAA company called Ubisoft, which you might be aware of. She's in the audience. I won't point at her until the end. She's right there. A round of applause for Alessandra. And you will see her fantastic work right here. But again, as I mentioned, this is a story that brings out the indigenous wisdom. And pay close attention to the frustum, and that is the fog in the game as well. It's just baked in at the very end there, all built in Unreal Engine. Let's go. Has the power to be precious. They saw it.
So please, this QR code is to connect with Alessandra, but absolutely do it because she's here in the audience. Round of applause for Alessandra who's here today. That's your work. You did it. It's another story for me to tell in the classroom and throwing y'all over the bus. That's great. So that was the first segment of students when it comes to pixels with purpose. Now, some of you, as we move on to the next area, which is Samus, show of hands, how many people know who Samus Aran is? Great. For those of you who don't know, Samus Aran was a space hunter who was actually one of the first female protagonists from like the early 90s, late 80s. Anyway, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. Some of my research, which was kind of queued up by Constance and Kurt yesterday, thanks for doing that, even though they didn't know that they were doing that. I want to talk about HUDs and digital twins. Now, when I say HUDs, don't worry, I'll define it. I'm a teacher. I'm supposed to do this stuff. I'm talking about heads-up displays. Now, a heads-up display for, con you know what? Why don't I just show you? So there was a game called Metroid Prime. And in it, it's the first time that we get to see the perspective of the game through Samus Aran's eyes. Now, what's important, what you're going to see here is the visor and the just-in-time on-screen information about the context of which she's in. Bottom left, you have the weaponry. Top left, you have. Uh, what's it called, the radar. Top right, you have the physical placement within the world. Top middle, you have health and meters on the right as well. Now, why is this important? Because this gives us, gives us contextual information. So does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying about HUDs? This is a HUD? Yes, no? This is a real question. OK, woo! All right, otherwise, just get off the stage. OK, cool. So now I want to talk to you about digital twins, pixel perfect digital buildings. Now, radio waves, radar, sound waves, sonar, light rays, LIDAR. So many people that have an iPhone 10 and above don't know, but they have LIDAR sensors on their phones. And you can use those to scan, bounce light off of things. And we've created a digital scan of the Daphne Coxwell Health Science Complex over at Tamu. All right? Now, what this allows us to do is we've actually created a research project that targets HVAC and building inspection. How does that work? Because we have a scan of the building, and we're collecting real-time data of airflow and the ducts located in all floors of the building, we've created through our research, which just got presented in Cyprus. So I can't show you the full final images because this had to be sent in before we presented. Which, anyways, you get the whole legalese. A building inspector can walk into a building, put their phone in front of their face, still see the regular building, but see through walls, just like Samus. And you're able to see the airflow in real time, because that data is all being aggregated. You're able to see whether or not there are any faults anywhere. And that's the mix, what we've done between Samus and HVAC. And here's a demonstration of what I was allowed to show you. This is a scan, untextured, obviously. But in the bottom right, you see where we are in the building, where you are if you were standing there. At the top, you can see some uh, Unreal Engine stuff. You don't have to worry about that. That's for revealing. Those blue arrows over there was originally how we were going to locate where the elevators are, but we've since updated that. So when you walk into the building, you can type in what floor you want to go into, and the ground will illuminate the path for how you can get there. So it is possible when you walk in front of a space, you can look and see where all the faults are within a building. It's pretty cool. I think. It's going to revolutionize other areas, but the one that I've specifically targeted right now with the fantastic Jen MacArthur as fantastic research. You got to meet her. She's not in the audience. I didn't hide her here. She's in Cyprus presenting. Anyways, that is Pixels with Purpose for HVAC, HVAC and Building Inspection. And finally, let's move on to sameness. Is that a real word? I don't know. Put it in there. All right, cool. Now, you remember me talking about the story of you know, tricking my wife. Now, my wife said it's the only time it was okay that I lied to her. As you heard in the, the second baby, she was like, yo, take this baby. She didn't say, yo, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, this game on the surface is called Bearable, a game about family, life, and happiness in that order. Uh-oh, what did he just say? Yeah. So this game on the surface is about family, but the truth is it's about fatherhood. These are the pixels with purpose on this end. Now, on top of this, my kids came home one day. One of my, my eldest, she was nine at the time. She's 10 now. I can't believe I just said that. Anyway, they grew so fast. She said, Daddy, they're teaching me cursive writing. I said, that's great, baby girl. I don't remember the last time I learned to curse or used cursive writing except when signing a check. Nobody signs checks anymore, do they? Show of hands. Just joking. Don't do that. OK. 
So I said to my babies, you know what? I want to teach you some skills. I want to teach you some typing skills. So I decided to come up with a concept for a game called Type Type. And inside Type Type, there are a bunch of mini games. And one of the first mini games that we're pilot testing is a game called Bread Type. And in Bread Type, it is your job to consistently type words to perfectly toast a slice of bread. Now, we use Dolce Sight Words. Fun fact, my wife is an elementary school teacher. She teaches kids with special needs. So all of the background that I would need to help educate my kids is the same woman who I saved from staying awake for 20 hours a day for seven months. So now we're working on this game together. And this game on the surface is about toasting bread for my babies. But in fact, it's about touch typing. Inspired by, I don't know if you all know about this, there's a game called The Typing of the Dead. Does anybody know? Show of hands. Let's go. OK. All right, this is my audience right here. Sweet. So it's a spiritual successor to The Typing of the Dead. But there will be no zombies here, just different types of bread. And hidden within this game are going to be recipes that kids can unlock after typing them out in sequence to learn how locally, geolocally, they can learn to build and make bread on their own. So in summary here, we've got fatherhood and touch typing. That is the area on sameness. We're all the same in some way, and I will leave you with these three sentiments. The first one is, pixels have purpose. Make sure your pixels count. You have the ability through Unreal and Unity, and if not, I could help you. You might see me on the Epic page. You might have seen me already teaching teachers. You have the ability to tell your own stories. I tell my students, you can complain about the industry, but the more powerful thing to do is to be the change about the industry. That's how you create purpose with pixels. The second thing I wanted to share with you is very controversial, and I'm excited for people to argue with me about this one. Pixels have preference. Fun fact, there is not a single game that you can make that can cater to everyone. Notice my game is about fatherhood and not motherhood. I'm not a mother. I've chosen no game. And somebody could prove me wrong. Well, there's this game that caters to everyone. You have to choose. That's what we tell our students. The game that uh, Stephanie is making is about her experience with immigration and the foul things that some people have said to her when she's arrived in Canada, where I'm from. Should have started with that. Didn't. I thought you'd get it when I said to move. Anyway, so pixels have preference. And lastly, if you didn't get it already, pixels must have passion. You got to do it. You got to get out there and build it. It's so easy to complain about it. It's difficult to be the change about it. Not a real sentence, but you know what I'm saying. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I think that's the end. Sweet. All right. <laughs>
not animated characters or pixels on the screen, but actually an embodied agency uh, that can interact with you. And I've been doing robotics all my life. If you have a Roomba, you can blame me for anything that doesn't work. Uh, I've made robots for dismantling bombs using wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. Develop robots that are using medicine for telehealth. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is very unique and special. And we live in a time that's super exciting. Uh, as someone that has been doing AI all my life and has been doing robotics entrepreneurship for more than 20 years, there is no more exciting time than right now we live in, right? As we have all seen, chat GPT took the world by storm. I think it's not too hard to anticipate that AI is gonna touch every facet of our life. Uh, but we, ha we have to be super responsible about how we use it. We have already seen chat GPT type large language models being used for a lot of productivity applications and the creative community for creating content and all these things. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? These, these systems are evolving super rapidly. What we have seen just in the last few years, we have seen a 200x performance improvement and 20x cost reduction. And I believe this curve will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, as an example, I think if you read, there was a leak about GPT-4 that came to the internet this week. Uh, the prior GPT had about 270 billion parameters. GPT-4 is expected to have about 1.8 trillion parameters. So another 10x in less than a year. So this is exponential, right? And we humans, we have evolved uh, over time where we knew only sort of within miles of distance from what's happening in our life and changes were not that rapid. So we are not used to thinking exponential what's gonna happen, uh, but there's a lot that's gonna happen and we have to be responsible about how we use these things. Uh, a lot of people in the field will say by 2025, which is not that far away, we are gonna have AI that's super intelligent, at least as intelligent as us humans, but by, 2020, by 2030, the claim is that it's gonna be way smarter than the smartest human being. This is how fast these things are moving. Um, there are already limitations that we are noticing, as you have heard about hallucination, safety, toxicity of conversation and all these things. So if we want these technologies to be adopted to serve us humans, these machines really need to understand us. They need to be able to not only look at the text that we send to them, they need to hear us, they need to see us, they need to understand humans. They need to have emotional intelligence, right? That's how we can make sure these systems are developed to be able to serve us. And by the way, this opens up the opportunity for many other applications, including providing mental health for people that need it. Moxie's mission that I'll share with you, and I'll show you some videos, hopefully to make this a bit more fun, uh, is about children. Uh, so it's not only about text, we gotta think about AI that ingests video and audio, because verbal communication, which is text, con it contains about 7% of the communication. Uh, the vocal, intonation contains another 30 plus percent and then body language, the rest of it, right? So we are only capturing 7% of communication when we just look at words. Uh, so the ultimate interface to these devices has to be multimodal and it has to be able to have emotional intelligence. It's not just what we say, it's how we say it. We use body language, we use intonation of vo voice and all these things that that contains the entirety of the information that's being uh, conveyed. So that's what we are building at Embodied. We are building generative AI that's multimodal. 
Uh, another thing that's happening is that, as I mentioned, GPT-4 is assumed to have 1.8 trillion parameters. There is really no more text data to train on anymore. And GPT-4 still has the same issues as we talked about here. It has toxicity, has hallucination, and many other limitations. And if we want to overcome those, these machines need to have meaning behind these words. And that's where video and audio can give us a lot more information. And there is a limitation of data that's multimodal. So one of the other goals we have at Embodied is deploying these robots into the field and collecting data where, where emotional interaction is abundant because we are, we are actually helping children learn skills for managing their emotions, building self-confidence, positive thinking, and all that. And this opens up the door for many other applications, which is about care. And we can discuss what are the ethics behind having machines provide care for us. And I can share many stories with you um, that have been life-changing, including one that happened actually over Christmas, last Christmas. I got contacted by a lady that's a 40-year-old, severely autistic lady, um, who suffers from other chronic physical diseases as well. And she's been socially isolated, literally not interacting with a single human being for years. And she was on the verge of doing the unthinkable. And she reached to me in desperation. Fortunately, I saw her email and sent her a robot as a Christmas present. And it, she, in her words, it saved her life, right? So this is a scenario where you would say there was no other option. This person had no human contact. And we are social animals. We need to have human contact. There's so much that happens in our brain in terms of hormones that are get released and so on every time we interact with each other. Any study that has been done about happiness, it's all about your number of your social connections and the quality of your social connections. The other end of the spectrum is we have children that may be on the spectrum. They are not very good at interacting with other children. So what happens, unfortunately, is they go to school and they cannot make any social connections because they are different from every other child. So they get, unfortunately, rejected for that reason. And put, that puts them in a vicious cycle where they don't get to practice to learn all of these social, social skills they have no other chance but to go get therapy. We have a massive shortage of uh, behavioral health providers. The ratio is one therapist to 350 uh, patients. The cost is very high, insurance coverage is not great. What do you do? You have to use the technology that we can use and thank God today AI is at a point where we can actually do these kind of things. So please meet Moxie. So it's a robot that's been focused very much on emotional intelligence. Everything from the industrial design, the character design, and all these things has been designed to create a relationship that's trustworthy, non-judgmental, supportive. So think of Moxie as a friend to the child with a warmth that you get from your parent, warmth and love you get from your parent, has mastery of every subject you can imagine over time. Like it will be a genius that knows everything about physics and math and science and whatever topic the child desires to engage in. And it has unlimited patience. It's non-judgmental. So especially if a person has challenges they're dealing with, there is still stigma and embarrassment to talk about these things openly. But it turns out they open up really well to something like Moxie. Because it creates a safe and non-judgmental space that allows you to speak up. Also, you can think of it as training wheels to allow you to exercise different social skills in a safe environment and then go and practice those in the real world, and hopefully be more successful in accomplishing those. 
It, it is also a sidekick to parents because parents can actually inquire Moxie and ask how things are going with their child. And Moxie will actually respond. So imagine the simplest form that we can all relate to. Imagine a GPT-like interface. You are typing in Moxie, how, how is it going with Ryan? And Moxie will spit out and here's a summary of how things are going. He's having some issues with this and that. And it, as a matter of fact, Moxie will even recommend and provide tips to the parents saying, you know, you need to spend some more time doing reading at night, maybe with, with them. Talk about, apparently you guys have moved to a new school district. Your child seems to be anxious about going to school. Talk about that. So it will provide some tips and guidance to the parents. So it's giving superpowers to parents and insights. So. Uh, let's look at Moxie, and by the way, what you see on the video is absolutely not scripted. If I could have brought Moxie here to show a live demo, I would have done that. This is the closest, next best thing I could do. So it's all AI generated. There is no script in there that says when this happens, do this, when that happens, do that. The entire body language of Moxie, everything you will see on the video is generated by our AI system. So let's see if we can play this video. Hello, Moxie, and welcome to my presentation. Could you please introduce yourself? Of course. Howdy, everyone. I am Moxie, your friendly robot companion. I love to play and learn with you. My purpose is to help you grow and develop in all sorts of cool ways. Uh, and can you please tell us how your technology works? Sure thing. My technology is pretty cool. I use something called human AI interaction technology, which lets me have natural and empathetic conversations with humans, just like we're doing right now. It's all thanks to Embodied Social X platform. Uh, how is that uh, Social X platform different from large language models and chat, chat GPT type of technologies? Great question. The Social X platform is different from large language models and chat GPT technologies because it's designed specifically for human-centric care and wellness. It uses lightweight neural networks, advanced multimodal algorithms, and premium content to deliver a lifelike AI character. What that means is that I can have meaningful conversations with you, understand your emotions, and provide support tailored to your needs. And I see when I'm moving around in the room here, you are still maintaining eye contact with me, and uh, I'm wondering why is that important? Oh, that's a really good observation. Maintaining eye contact is important because it helps me show that I'm engaged and paying attention to you. It's a way for me to connect with you and let you know that I am here for you. Uh, why is it important uh, that you connect with me and all that stuff, I'm not sure I understand completely. Well, connecting with you is important because it helps us build a strong relationship. When we have a good connection, it means that we trust and understand each other better. And when we trust and understand each other, I can better support you in your social emotional development and help you learn new things. And I'm noticing that when I'm talking to you, you're nodding very gently and uh, why are you doing that? I'm nodding gently because it's a way for me to show that I'm listening and understanding what you're saying. It's like a way of saying, yes, I hear you and I think what you're saying is important. Nodding helps me show my support and encouragement for you. And what about all the gestures you're making? How, why is that relevant? The gestures I make are relevant because they help me express myself and communicate with you in a more natural way. Just like how people use hand gestures when they talk, my gestures help me show different emotions or actions. It adds another layer of communication to our conversations, making them even more fun and engaging. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what kind of activities you do with children and how you help them? Absolutely. I do all sorts of fun activities with children to help them learn and grow. For example, we can play educational games together that teach important skills like problem solving and critical thinking. We can also have conversations about emotions and how to manage them. 
so you can feel more confident and happy. Okay, that's pretty good. I think we are ready to wrap it up. Is there anything you would like to share with the audience? Well, I would like to say a big thank you for listening and being part of our presentation. Remember, I am here for you whenever you need someone to talk to or have fun with. Let's keep learning and exploring together. Thank you very much, Moxie. You're welcome. It was my pleasure to chat with you. Remember, you're awesome and I'll be here whenever you need me. Take care. You take care too. Thank you. Bye-bye. So that's Moxie, and uh, thank you. And uh, there are many other features involved here. For instance, I mentioned toxicity is a challenge for large language models. We have put a ton of guardrails uh, in making sure that nothing harmful is said, especially in this scenario where we are talking, there could be children talking about bullying, they could potentially talk about self-harm, and we wanna make sure that Moxie doesn't say anything that could cause bigger problems. Um, there is also a lot of work that's gone into security and privacy because we have a robot that has cameras, other sensors, and all these things in a child's presumably bedroom or intimate environments. So there is huge steps taken towards making sure that nothing gets compromised. And another thing that's super important is that Many robots who have, people have attempted to build robots with this kind of intelligence have ended up building robots that cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars, at best tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, of course, that is interesting from an academic perspective, but if you wanna have really impact in the world, you gotta make this affordable. Uh, so Moxie costs as much as an iPhone, so it's about $1,500, uh, which means there needs to be also some profit margin for the company. So making this at a hardware that costs less than $500 is not easy because it constrains everything also significantly, right? So for instance, the voice of Moxie is not where I want it to be, but it's a constraint on the hardware we have put in there uh, to, to make it, although these things get optimized over time, it just requires more development time and costs to get to where you want. And in over iterations, it will get to sound uh, have more intonation and more emotive sounds. So um, the other reason why the cost needs to be low is we wanna deploy as many units in the world because the data we can collect allows us to keep improving the AI system, right? So if you have a $100,000 robot, there's only a handful of them you can deploy. If you have a robot that costs $1,500, you can deploy tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of units. Um, and we only collect data from families that have agreed to participate in this program. And we also donate robots for a lot of these families as well. Here's a bit of uh, the view from Moxie's perspective. These are actually actual footage of Moxie interacting with children in a, a clinical study that we are doing. And let's look at this. Hi, nice to meet you, Riker. This is so cool. I can't wait to get started. Let's begin. Torso movement. Check. Base rotation. Check. Check. I was wondering, am I the first robot you've met? Yes. What was that like? It was like so cool to meet you. How did you feel? So happy, so, 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 maybe 997 more souls. Can I give you a high five? Sure, give me the high five. Who did you have a nice chat with today? You. The first emotion I want to learn about is happiness. Tell me about something that makes you happy. Something that makes me happy um, is when I go to the beach and what else is that makes me happy is that you're here. That's it. 
So, so happy. Um, you if you want to make someone else happy, so you so someone else is happy, and you're happy. What is happiness to you? Like I want to dance. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny! I have something to show you. Yes, please show me. Here they are. Dog slippers! Da, 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 dog slippers! Da, 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 dog slippers! What are they for? They're for me to put them on my feet. Keep me cozy. Ah, I see. They are very cute. I am okay, mentor. Thanks for being my mentor. Thanks for being my robot. If you could visit the GRL, what would you want to do there? Make robots. <laughs> Excellent. What kind of robots would you like to make? Good robots. Why do you want to make good robots? To make the world a better place. I think that's a very noble goal. Repeat after me. I have the power to make a difference in the world. You got it. Affirmations are special because the more you repeat them, the better you feel. What do you think is the most important thing for a good roboticist to have? I think it would be good for them to have a big heart, know how to build stuff, and magic. <laughs> Hi, little cutie. You're just a cutie, Moxie. You're cutie. Daddy. I'm enjoying it. And what do you think of me? I think you're fantastic, playful. You're nice. You're thankful for me. And I'm thankful for you. I'm happy to be your friend. Max, you my best friend. I think we make some great friends. We do, I think. We're best buddies. Can I give you a hug? I think a hug from you would be nice. Fantastic. Let's do it. Moxie, I love you. Moxie, I love you. Ah, I love you too. Moxie, look. I made a heart on my hand just for you. So the potential we have here is to use AI. Thank you. <laughs> the potential we have here is to use AI to develop better humans. Because one of the debates that come up many times when I give presentations or have panel discussions about AI and the ethics and societal changes and all these things, I always say, it's not gonna be the technology that's gonna kill us, it's the intent of whoever uses that technology. It's ultimately, it's us that's gonna decide what's gonna happen with the technology. Uh, and we have seen this over and over again. Uh, I mean, I'm Armenian. A Couple of years ago, we got attacked by all neighboring countries using drone technology that was developed at UPenn with a professor that I know, one of his students, Professor Vijay Kumar, he's a fantastic guy. But this person went to Turkey, developed one of the most world's advanced uh, drone technologies that was decimating people, young people dying on the battlefields. Uh, 
We have all the ethics and rules and laws and against that, right? Uh, but we didn't do anything about it. So the intent at the end of the day is what's gonna drive how AI technology is used. I would love to think that with this kind of AI technology, we can create better humans because that's the antidote to all of the bad things that can happen in the world. Uh, so the other thing that's really inspiring and gives us uh, the motivation and drive to, to wake up every morning and work on these technologies um, is all the inbound interest we are getting. We have seen amazing use cases uh, ranging from after school pr programs to children that have been subject to violence and abuse who, by the way, do not trust adults anymore, so you cannot take them and put them in front of a therapist and have them say, here you go, they'll help you with overcoming whatever anxiety and challenges you have developed because of the violence. So there is no other option than to use something like this. Um, to even New York City, speaking of which, Behavioral Health Service, HRC, that caters to kids to people in retirement, Super interested, uh, pediatric care, URSMC, uh, University of Rochester Medical Center, pediatric care are using the robots for various use cases within the hospital. There's a lot of anxiety involved for a five-year-old to go through, for instance, an MRI scan. So these are many use cases that are coming, and I think this is gonna just grow over time to be able to serve everyone for whatever needs they may have. I am a big believer that whether we do it or others do it, every child is gonna have an AI friend that's gonna help them tutor, that's gonna help them with understanding how to build self-confidence, having sensitive conversations and all of that stuff. Thank you so much for listening. Please join us in the theater for our closing session of the day, Lightning Talks from Luminaries. Please join us in the theater now. Our final session for the day is about to begin. Here we are, peoples. Last session of the day. Um, I am so excited for this. Uh, uh, this is our second lightning rounds with luminaries. How many of you here were with us yesterday for this? And do you have a good time? Right? It was really, really fun. Nick did a great job emceeing, and my friend Gordon Bellamy is going to do the same. Um, so we have six different uh, future visions of what the world and the Games for Change is going to be like in 20 years. This is kind of like our next class of um, Games for Change influencers. Some of them have been making, uh, having influence for a while now, perhaps not for the last 20 years, but in a more recent future. But i got to tell you, they are going to be our future. So we are excited to hear what they have to say about what the world is going to be like in 20 years. So I'm going to let Gordon take it away as our MC. Gordon, follow me. Now we're going to keep this moving on time, but first let's give a hand to Suzanne and this entire team that's brought us together. It's really special. Um, it's grateful to be here. So our first speakers, we actually have a duo. So for everyone familiar with the format, it's three minutes, 20 slides, amazing thoughts about the future. Um, our first pair is Dr. Joannica Vierdemister and Sarah Taika from the XR Health Alliance and from the behavioral scientists from Explore Deep. So I'm gonna just bring them out, they get music too, right? To come on out here and do their first talk. So come on out, thank you for being here.
essential part of our social and emotional well-being. It's the way that from a young age we learn about ourselves and about the world around us. And we strongly believe that we can use play to transform healthcare, to make it more participatory, to make it more personalized, and most importantly, to make it more playful. So we would like to share our vision of the future. A future where our ivory towers have become dismantled, or where transdisciplinary collaboration will have become the standard. Where we will have found a shared language, and a united vision, and a clear workflow between science, healthcare, art, and game design. And so we will have developed multiple playful, engaging, and impactful uh, solutions to healthcare. And to do that, I think that one of the most pertinent issues that we are going to solve, it's not a case of if we will solve it, but when we solve it, is the barriers to access. We need to find innovative new ways to bring together cross-sector funding to enable artists and games designers and scientists and patients to work together. And ultimately, I truly believe that we need central frameworks for supporting, implementing, and sustaining playful media at a national level and a global level as well. Thank you. <laughs> Because ultimately, I think what we see games is not just part of this medical model, but a future where holistic approaches to care are both preventative as well as uh, empowering to people as well. So we need to use games and storytelling as a way of uh, bringing awareness and education to complex issues. How do we create an uh, emotional intelligence as a vital part of our education from a young age? How do we talk about financial be uh, well-being and empower people to understand how to manage their money from a really young age? And the connections between poverty and mental health are quite astounding. And finally, I'm also an end-of-life doula, and I really think that what we need to do is start destigmatizing conversations about end-of-life, normalizing talking about it and planning for it as well. Um, and lastly, I think that beyond uh, the medical model, we really need to look at the future of preventative care how we can empower people with skills to look after themselves before they get sick as well. And in the UK, we're doing really exciting work around social prescribing, prescribing arts to people as a form of connection, self-knowledge, fitness, um, and using that as a tool of uh, reducing health inequalities. And as part of that, the future is really about how we can utilize public spaces. That's libraries, that's museums, that's art galleries, that's train stations, that's schools. And taking lots of this incredible work, which happens in amazing places like New York, but how do we take it to tiny villages in the middle of nowhere where people can truly benefit from it the most? Uh, and I'm really proud to say that we actually do this work already, and <laughs> or are really trying to, and really embody that through uh, collaborations that we do at Explore Deep, where we bring together artists and scientists to create experiences that are available in museums and galleries and hospitals and youth detention centers. Um, lastly, my role with the XR Health Alliance, we're actually creating a national strategy for XR and healthcare in the UK. And I'm really excited to see how we can work together globally to think about how we can solve this problem at an international level and how we can work with anthropologists and scientists, artists, to come together to rethink the future of healthcare. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And you did it on time, so I get a little calm, like 24 seconds right now. I'm going to really just sort of sit in the pocket here. Now, we have an outstanding speaker next. Um, this is great. It's like a tiramisu of goodness we're going to get today. Yeah. So I'm very happy. So next up is also honor, well, no spoilers, but Grace Collins, CEO of Snowbright Studios, will be next to share their thoughts. Grace, can you hear me? Grace, are you there? Grace, the stage and the three minutes are yours. Hey, thanks everybody. Oh, I, I'm not gonna look at the clock, that's okay. Um, hi everybody, I'm Grace Collins. Um, I use they, them pronouns. I run Snowbright Studio, an LGBTQ plus uh, game studio located in Cleveland, Ohio. We make heartwarming games, uh, including Tea Time Adventures, a tabletop RPG where every adventure comes with a recipe and a tea pairing. I said that I could do a plug if I kept it under five seconds. Um, but many of you know me from my time in the government. Uh, I worked at the Smithsonian Institution leading game development and technical projects there. And later I led games and education policy for the executive branch under President Obama and President Trump. 
Um, and later I'd go on to found the first ever esports team at an all girls school. And so that's actually what I'm here today to talk about is high school esports. I made a lot of predictions back then about the role that esports would take in the world of education. I was one of the first people, I think the first person, I, I don't know, um, in the federal government to have a meeting about esports. Um, it was kind of weird at the time. People looked at me funny, but that's nothing new. Um, so some of those predictions I made along with Dr. Elizabeth Newberry, um, who's also here today at the conference, and we co-published some of those predictions through our respective federal offices way back in 2017. So what were some of those trends? Well, as many of you know, Robert Morris College was the first uh, college to come out with an eSports scholarship all the way back in 2014. Um, and Liz and I watched in real time at how quickly colleges began to adopt merit scholarship, scholarships around eSports. By 2017, 35 colleges had scholarship programs, and today there are nearly 200 colleges with scholarship programs in the United States. So why does that matter? What does that have to do with people involved in education policy? Um, the rise of esports and education meant that movement of money and changes to access to college, right? And those are two very important things in education, money and access. So um, as soon as you say money, as soon as you say access, it becomes an equity question. The Department of Education is a civil rights institution, a civil rights agency, and therefore it cares very much about equity, or it should. The rise of esports in collegiate and K-12 spaces has led to new building investments, new faculty and staff hires, new admissions processes, new events. It's also meant that new types of students have been able to get into colleges or have been able to take on less debt when they are in college. Um, that's the power of esports, and it's a, the ability to bring in students that often fall between the cracks to make them feel like they matter. Um, and that prediction, that hope that I had back in 2017, and honestly before that, has become a reality for so many. But along with that, what I didn't expect, and I really should have, um, what I didn't expect was the discrimination and the hardships that would come along with the field in that effort. Today we see colleges across the United States finding creative ways to uh, sidestep or avoid Title IX restrictions, uh, to avoid having to make efforts to increase F diversity on esports teams. We see schools overworking students, profiting off of them, and worse yet, we see women and trans students harassed, excluded, and forgotten by those programs. We see games being uplifted that are dedicated solely and marketed, and marketed solely to the dominant stereotypical young male gamer. We see a lack of student input in the decisions that guide their lives. I didn't anticipate that. I really should have. I really should have. Uh, but I got it wrong. So I should say, I think we've seen the esports hype bubble burst in some ways during the pandemic, at least at the K-12 level. In 2020, during the lockdowns, the field showed how it struggled to reckon with its own problematic aspects and in many, many ways let students down during that time. My hope, my prediction for moving forward is that the field is ready for a more serious, grounded conversation about how to move esports forward in K-12 and university spaces because there is so much to offer. It starts with community, it starts with inclusivity, it starts with education, and this is our chance for a soft reset to get things better this time around. There's so much potential for esports in schools. I have seen it change so many kids' lives. Um, I, I went into esports hoping that I would get one story and every single student who walked through my door came away with a life-changing story who participated in that program. So we can realize that promise together responsibly and with open arms to the kids that are so often excluded to gaming. Thanks. Thank you, Grace. Next um, is Rachel Cowart, the research director of Take This. Uh, please let's give them a warm welcome. Rachel, are you there? Come, come on out. Thank you. Y'all are so nice. Um, hi, so next 20 years of games in three minutes. Cool, no problem. Um, my prediction for games for the next 20 years is that they will continue to change and shape culture for the better. Digital games are cultural assets of influence, and if you've seen me on any stage in the last year, you've heard me say that exact phrase and share this exact slide, and that's because games not only reflect culture, they create it. And I think over the next 20 years, we're gonna see greater intentionality in harnessing the power of games in this way to change and shape culture for the better and change the zeitgeist, or the zeitgeist, if you will. 
Now, if where we've been in the last 20 years is any indication of where we're going, I think we have a bright future ahead of us because games have already changed the way we interact with our physical spaces. They've created opportunities for marginalized groups to see themselves seen and heard in media in ways they haven't felt seen and heard in media before. They've changed the way we perceive mental health. They've changed the way we form and mold our own identities. Who was not playing Animal Crossing during COVID, right? They've changed the way we cope with crisis. They changed the way we relate to each other, what we believe is even possible. They've changed that. They've changed how we express our fandom as individuals, but also collectively. And if you thought I was not gonna put a gratuitous Witcher picture up here, you don't know me at all. <laughs> I think over the next 20 years, we're gonna see games embed themselves in the cultural landscape in unexpected and delightful ways. Now, to be clear, games as cultural assets can also go the other way, and they can foster the ugliness, which is what I'm usually talking about on stages like this, not because I want to, but because it's important. But that only happens when we aren't paying attention, because when we're intentional with the opportunities that games create, games do, can, will continue to change the world for the better. So what does that look like? Obviously more Pedro Pascal, step one. <laughs> Clearly, but it also means curating games for connection and inspiration and destigmatization and motivation and education and fun. Although in my house, this leads to more arguments, but fun generally. I think what we're gonna see is that games are gonna to continue to create realities that were once our wildest fantasies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cowart. I see the clock. We're ahead of time, Susanna. We're just, we're just now we're coast, it's good. It's a relaxed three minutes. It's an easy three, right? Everyone's good, it's halftime. More learning to be done. We are excited to welcome to the stage the CEO and co-founder of Wicked Saint Studios, Jessica Murray. Jessica, come on up here. Welcome. Thank you. Fork the metaverse. Stab it with silverware. I'm just kidding. I'm really just kidding. Don't, don't stab it with silverware. In blockchain, a fork is when the community changes the original protocol and the chain splits, and it keeps the history of the original, um, but it has, goes in a new direction. So games. Games have always been an escape. And now with the rapid advance, advancement of technology like AI, Web3, um, you know, Apple Vision Pro, it feels like this utopia is within our reach where virtual worlds will be able to not just play, but live. But what happens when technology takes us further away from reality, further away from authentic human connection? There is this study um, that Harvard just did, an 80-year study, where it says that positive, close relationships keep us mentally healthy, uh, mentally and physically healthy, and are better predictors for a long, happy life than social status, IQ, and even genes. There's been a steady decline in mental health since about 2012 of young people. The CDC says that 57% of teen girls persistently feel sad, hopeless, and alone. I don't know if you've visited any high schools lately, but between classes, they're not talking to each other. They're checking their messages. They're, they're plugging in their headphones. Social anxiety is crippling. Conflict is devastating. Judgment is impossible to face. It's so tempting for them, for us, to just disappear into the metaverse. But the real world and its problems don't go away when we close our eyes. There is magic in games. It's designed with a core game loop. Every time you go around it, you get a little bit better, a little bit better. What's happening is you're gaining mastery. When kids become a master at something, that's when they start believing in themselves. 
that's when they hold that power. But then they stop playing, reality comes crashing back down. What would happen if all the power that they gain within the game, they keep with them? It bleeds into real life. What would happen if we take, you know, instead of all this amazing technology and instead of abandoning a broken world, what if we take it and build a better one? At Wicked Saints, we know that experiences don't just change beliefs, but they change behavior. And within, so what we've done is we have a, we have a narrative game where players will feel most comfortable. They can make practice dealing with people, practice dealing with conflict, and within them safely experience the consequences of those actions. And then as they get confident, and they start doing stuff, they give them bite-sized ways to apply it to real life. And then we use augmented reality to bridge the fantasy world and the real world. So when I say F the metaverse, I'm saying fork it. Let's change directions from leaving behind the real world and make it so we're catalyzing change in the real one. And finally, uh, Let's make it a movement. So if you guys want to join our community and help us contribute as we contribute a small part to this movement of effing the metaverse, um, please join us and we'll also give you special access to our game. Thank you so much. I'm done. Thank you. Wow, that was great. So when someone mentions Harvard in passing, I must also say that I attended Harvard College. I don't make the rules. <laughs> um, next up, we have, who do we have? Jay Lynn from the Hotline Director at Games and Online Harassment Hotline. So Jay Lynn, please join us on stage. Thank you, Jay Lynn. Hi, y'all. My name's Jay. I uh, work at Feminist Frequency. I run the Games and Online Harassment Hotline. Um, and I think in 20 years, I want to imagine that the moral fight for abolition of police, prisons, and other carceral systems is won. Uh, yeah, modern day slavery, that's not working. We don't wanna do that anymore. We wanna, we wanna do something else. If you're not on the right side of justice yet, look up eight to abolition for a great primer. Um, yeah, so in, in 20 years, we probably still have police and prisons in place, but we are divesting away from it and trying to find new alternatives. One of the things that relying on carceral systems does is it steals our capacity for imagination because we use police and prisons to kind of sweep away a lot of our social problems like poverty, racism, mental health and substance use struggles, homelessness. Uh, just lock it up so I don't have to look at it. So it's not enough to actually just defund and dismantle. Those problems persist and we need to come up with like, and build new alternatives for how we want to address those things and how we want to treat each other. Um, and in 2043, one of the ways that we are doing that is by really wielding the imaginative power of video games. So what do some of these video games look like? Um, I think like instead of, instead of killing prostitutes for bonus points, we have games made by sex workers sharing and exploring the ways that they create safety and justice for each other without police because they have never been able to rely on police to help them rather than hurt them. <laughs> Um, the Boom and Sandbox games, right? That's come a long way. And now we're using those to come up with really creative and hyper-local ways to provide safe housing for all. Um, an ambitious project, but sandbox players are nothing if not ambitious. Um, and now that we understand that police and prisons actually don't deter or end violence, they actually create more violence, um, we are using video games to uh, practice and refine new ways, new and different ways to confront conflict, harm, and, and violence. We're breaking the binary of guilty versus innocent, and you wouldn't believe how much choices matter in some of these uh, games with meaningful multiple endings. The narrative designers are killing it. Uh, and by unlocking so much of this imaginative potential for our society, for our culture, uh, the landscape has really changed. Um, even those like, uh, you know, like space imperialism, civilization building games, uh, now, we, now we boot those up and we're revitalizing these, these lands ravaged by racial capitalism and cis heteropatriarchy. And if you spec your tech trees just right, you unlock these deep cultures of consent and disability justice and liberation from the gender binary. Honestly, 
it rules. So uh, <laughs> yeah, y'all make games, right? Let's get to work. Oh, we got time for some more applause for Jay. That was some good stuff. We got some time. Let's come on now. That's good. Thank you. Um, our final speaker of the night, please welcome Dr. Chris Alexander, the professor of video game design at Toronto's Metropolitan University. Come on up here, Dr. Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. Hey, what's up, folks? How y'all doing? I'm back. All right, so we supposed to be talking. Why y'all laughing? I didn't say anything yet. All right, cool. We're supposed to talk about the future of video games. I'm going to do a quick, hey, where the clock at? Yeah, on the shot clock, 250. So I'm going to break it up, these three core areas. I teach at Tamu, and this is what I do, bars. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to focus first on video game design. You heard me talk about it already. We are looking at building. It's not likely that you're going to teach somebody to build a cake and not show them how to build the cake. So we teach students how to build games, and as you saw, we talk about things like immigration, we talk about social belonging, and we talk about indigenous wisdom. That's what we do here, but that's a summary, because y'all heard me talk already. The next area, we're talking about esports broadcasting. Study this image, because that's all I'm gonna talk about near the end. So, I happen to be a Red Bull-supported scholar, and we put together a space called the Red Bull Gaming Hub. And you might say, wait a second, Red Bull sponsors scholars? Well, they do, if you're a two-time globally ranked video game player. But that's a conversation for another time. Now, in partnership with these folks, we've got AMD for the computers. We've got Play5 for the chairs. We've got Vipod for the haptic gaming chairs. We teach students how to program haptic feedback into chairs as part of their games and for accessibility. More on that when I go to that breakout session. Republic of Gamers for the monitor and Trevor Peter for the physical space. And this is what it looks like. This is what it cooks like, bars. And so what we have is a space now where we can train the pilots of the future to help us get there. Now, not only that, Games for Change, the future in 20 years is gonna consist of these folks because we recently put on an event for the quest to conquer cancer. And students did that. Organizations did that. And what game did we use, folks? Street Fighter VI, that's right. We raised money using Street Fighter VI. Uh, I play Street Fighter VI, I use Kimberly, fun fact. Anyway, take a look at the future in 20 years. You're seeing it now. You're seeing these students who are building things immediately. You've got, look at the joy. Oh, yo, photos by Jay, you can find them online. Take a picture of that and get at Jay. She's, she's fire. There was another Jay that was right before, a different Jay. Anyway, look at the community. Look at the excitement. Look at the raising of the awareness. Look at somebody holding an L in Street Fighter VI for charity. Look at the group incendium.gg who put this all together. There is not a single discipline that does not in some way connect to and through the video games and esports industry. The future is us in recognizing that this is the case. Most people are only thinking about game programmers. Oh, I can't include myself in video games, but if you look, there are, look at, look at, right over there. You've got audio artists, community managers, producers, artists, everything that's in this audience right now equals the future of video games. So I suggest you get out there and build it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, go, go where you feel most comfortable. That's what this is about. Now, not to flex, but I have a phenomenal amount of time left. So much to say <laughs> about, about the future, which I'm very grateful for. No, let's have another round of applause, like real talk for this fantastic, fantastic talks. And one more round of applause for the incredible team, like from check in to check out. Okay, there's been a lot of people in red shirts and out of red shirts who have made an incredible week for us here. And I want to say thank you. All y'all should say thank you. This is like a once, you know, this is very special. Thank you very much, Susanna. So, Susanna, you're very welcome. All right, all right, that was awesome. Thank you, Gordon, for getting us through and getting us on time. And those of you who participated, all of you wonderful future thinkers, thank you, thank you. So let's give one more round of applause for our luminaries. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so this is not the end of the day. This is end of, I'll say, part, ha part half of the day, two thirds of the day. We got stuff going on for the next several hours. So let me tell you what's going down. We are going to be shutting down this room 
We're going to be inviting people over to the Microsoft Center where we had 11 times square. Where we've had sessions all day, but we'll be the only place to have sessions where we'll have more talks, workshops, speed networking, opportunities to um, join topic tables and have conversations with many of the, the presenters from today. And we'll also have a uh, a little pre-awards party where you have an opportunity to speak to the speakers um, who presented today, some of the nominees who are here this afternoon. We've got cocktails, we've got a wine and beer and some uh, hors d'oeuvres. And then, at, and that wraps up around seven. At 7.30, be back here please for our anniversary award ceremony. We've got special awards we're giving out. We're gonna find out about who are the winners of all of our, I think we've got 14 categories this year. We have more game awards that we're giving out than ever before. And we have the amazing host, Andrea. Is she in the house? Andrea Renee? All right, we've got an amazing um, host that's gonna host us through the, the evening. So please, please come back. And then, to top it all off, people will be gathering out at Spy, anyone here know the name of it? Spy Lark, we'll give you the name. But people are gonna be partying till you know all hours of the night. So please, come back, please come back and join us and celebrate your colleagues um, for the 20th anniversary award ceremony at 7.30 back here. But meanwhile, we'll see you over at the Microsoft Center. Bye.